Judaism. They need to not drift back into Judaism. They need to not keep uh, the, the dead works of the law uh, anymore, that they need to grab onto Christ and hold onto that with both hands. And so he uses these Old Testament passages to show the greatness of Jesus. In the very first part of the book, he, he takes a passage from Psalm 110.1. The, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And he talks about how Jesus is the one who has ascended into heaven. Jesus is the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father, that position of power. That Jesus is the one who's ruling over this age. That he didn't say this to any of the angels. That he's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. And so we get that in the first part of the book up through chapter 4 and roughly verse 14. Uh, there he begins talking about Jesus as our high priest using a passage from Psalm 110 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he's been dealing with the implications of that passage, the fact that the law was in place already, and yet here's the, the psalmist saying that there's going to be another priest coming, right, a different kind of priest who's going to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron. Not, not because he's in the tribe of Levi, but made a priest by an oath, not by a fleshly commandment as we saw last week in chapter 7. <clears throat> and so Jesus is that high priest. Jesus is that one that, that uh, the Messiah, right, the Christ, that he's the one that God has enthroned as priest on his throne, that he's both king and priest at the same time. And so very similar to Mel what we saw with Melchizedek in that uh, that Melchizedek was a king of Salem and also a, a priest of God Most High. And so he's, he's sort of like that, that he's both priest and king at the same time. So he's been dealing with that. Now he's going to continue to talk about Jesus as our high priest through chapter 8 and verse 6. And he's getting ready, and we'll see that here towards the end of chapter 7. He's getting ready to, to make the, the switch to another passage, another Old Testament passage from Jeremiah 31 that talks about a new covenant that there's a, a better covenant that we have with Jesus. And so we're getting ready to, to get into all of that. And so in chapter 7, we'll, to get the context of what we're looking at here, we'll back up and just read uh, beginning in verse 20. Talking about Jesus, inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, right? Jesus was made priest by an oath. He, the Lord swore an oath, right? Uh, in verse 21, for they have become priests without an oath. But he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the Levitical priests that he's making this comparison to, they weren't made priests by an oath. They were made priests because they were born in the tribe of Levi. right? And those that are high priests, well, they were made high priests because they were born into Aaron's family and they were the oldest son. right? When the high priest passes away, that it, that it goes to the next that's in line. He says in verse 22, By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Here he's introducing this idea of covenant, that he's, he's getting ready to talk about the covenant. Right? He's a down payment, he's a guarantee, he's that earnest money uh, on a better covenant. Also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. We looked at the list uh, of the human high priests last week. Uh, that we find over in First Chronicles chapter 6. And so they weren't able to continue because at some point they died, right? They were human beings. And so when that high priest died, then they had to be replaced by somebody else. And when he died, he had to be replaced by somebody else. Well, Jesus' priesthood isn't going to be like that, right? There were a lot of priests under the Mosaic system because they eventually died and had to be replaced by somebody else. But Jesus... He's not going to pass away. He's not going to die, right? He, because he continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Never going to be turned over to somebody else, right? Never going to have somebody else that is a high priest that, that Jesus is going to step down from that position. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so in verse 25, he says, Therefore he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them, and this is where we ended up last week, that Jesus lives forever. He's able to save to the uttermost. He's able to save completely. He's able to save forever. And that doesn't mean that once we're once saved, always saved when we're on this earth. But once we get to heaven, right, we will be always saved once we get to heaven. We'll always be saved once we pass from this earth if, we, if we're in a right condition with the Lord. He's able to save to the uttermost who? Is he able to save everyone that way? He could, right? 
He died for everyone. He shed his blood for everyone. He, he could save everyone. But who does it specifically say that are saved to the uttermost here? In verse 25. Those that come to God, right, or those that draw near to God through him, through Jesus, right? And so not everyone is going to to do that. Not everyone's going to come to God through Jesus. People think that, well, they're going to, you know, check out the Zen Buddhism thing, or they're going, to, they're going to listen to what Muhammad said, or they're going to read the Book of Mormon and they're going to follow that instead. Not everyone is going to come to God through Jesus, right? Those that are going to be saved to the uttermost are those who come to God through him. <clears throat> and so we see the necessity, right, of going through Jesus if we're going to be able uh, to draw near. <clears throat> <clears throat> there's, there's no other way, right? In John chapter 14 and verse 6, even, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, right, except through me. You've got to go through Jesus. He's the, the door to the sheepfold in John chapter 10, right? He's the one that you've got to go through in order to have that safety, in order to get that sustenance. You've got to go through Jesus. And so, similar to how the, the Mosaic system would work with regards to the priests, in the Mosaic system, they would wash themselves, they would go through these mikvahs, right? They would be immersed in water, they would be cleansed in water, and then they would put on their priestly garments and then they would go into the temple and they would do their business. If we're gonna draw near to God through Jesus, we've gotta be washed from our sins, we've gotta be cleansed from our sins, and when does that take place? In baptism, right? We make contact with the blood of Christ through baptism. So we are immersed. And what is it that we put our, on? What, what priestly garments do we put on? Christ, right? As many of you as were baptized into Christ have done what? Have put on Christ. We put those priestly robes on. If we haven't done that, then we don't have the opportunity to draw near to God. We don't get to draw near to God. We don't have that avenue of prayer that other folks maybe would want to have. Because we've got we've to draw near to God through Jesus. We've got to put him on and, and not take him off. And that's kind of what the Hebrews writer is getting at, is that once you've become a Christian, once you have embraced Christ, once you've grabbed hold of that hope that's set before you, you need to hold on to that and not let go of it. You need to put Christ on and, and not take him off again. Right? It's not something that we just put on on Sunday morning and then we take it off for the rest of the week. Right, it's something that we have, to, we have to wear all the time if we're going to be able to draw near to God. Comments or questions on any of these things? <clears throat> so in verse 26 then, he says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, and then for the peoples, for this he did uh, once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. He says this high priest that we have that was fitting for us, he is a fitting high priest. He is perfect for us as our high priest. Uh, he says that he is holy, right? What does it mean to be holy or sanctified? unstained, clean, purified, set apart, right? That idea of, so he's, he's holy, he's been set apart. Jesus is the only one who could do what Jesus did, right? He's been set apart, he's holy, he's been sanctified for this, for this particular purpose. He came to earth and he lived and he didn't commit any sin, right? And so he's holy, he's harmless, right? That idea of being harmless is someone who's innocent, right? Someone who is, who is guiltless, right? He's harmless, he didn't have anything that he did that was against the law, right? Undefiled, that idea of something that's undefiled, that it's pure, right? How much defilement was it found in Jesus? Zero, right? When, when I drink this water, I hope that it has zero defilement in it, right? Sometimes we might tend to think of ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm 51% I'm good, so I'm okay because I'm 50. Would you drink this if it was 51% good? Would you drink this if it was 90% good? Would you drink it if it was 99% good? Would 1% uh, 
You know, if there was 1% sewage in there, would that be okay? See, in our, in our lives, we, we tend to think that, well, we know that we're going to make mistakes. We know that we're going to fall short. We know that we're not going to be 100% like he is. But what are we aiming for? Are we aiming for 51%? Are we aiming for 90%? You see, we ought to be aiming for 100 because we're going to fall short, right? We're going to fall short, and so we, ought, we need to think about what it is that we're aiming for. Because if you're aiming for the center of the target, right, if you're aiming for 100%, yeah, you're going to fall short, but you're going to come closer to that than if I'm just a- a- aiming at the edge of the target at the bottom. He's undefiled, separate from sinners, right? Well, he talks about those human high priests. They had weaknesses, they had things that they did that, that they, where they sinned, right? But Jesus, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, that Jesus was tempted in all ways, like as we are, yet without sin. Right, so he was tempted. It's not that he couldn't be tempted because he's God. He was tempted. He became flesh and blood. We saw that in chapter 2. He became flesh and blood so that he could be tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. And so it talks about him being separated uh, from sinners, the high priests weren't separated from sinners. They had, probably, they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, the Hebrews writer here says. He's been exalted above the heavens, right? He has become higher than the heavens. Now notice it says that he has become higher. If he's become higher than the heavens, what does that imply? At some point he was, he was lower, right? For a little while he was made lower than the angels that we saw in Hebrews chapter 2. Right? For a little while, while he was flesh and blood, he was lower than the angels. He was lower than the heavens. But now that he has died, right now that he has by himself purged our sins, he has arisen above the heavens to be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. You see how he's using what he's talked about before in tying these things together and being able to weave? I mean, the, the way that the Hebrews writer is able to weave these things together in this text is magnificent that he keeps talking about the same things, he keeps weaving in the same things that he's already built the base for, right, to bring back to our remembrance to see how all of these things fit together. And I think that's really cool uh, to be able to see that in in that way. And so he's exalted above the heavens, right? He has become again uh, higher than the angels. God crowned him with glory and honor uh, after he had uh, gone to the cross and purged uh, our sins. And so he doesn't need to offer up these daily sacrifices for himself. The high priests, they had sin, right? They're they're just men. They they make mistakes. And so they had sins of their own that they had to offer a sacrifice for themselves first. They had to get atonement for their own sin first, and then they would be able to take the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice in, and get atonement for the rest of the people. But Jesus didn't have any of that. He didn't need uh, to do that. He doesn't have to offer up those sacrifices daily, right? And so there's a contrast that's made here from the human high priests who are, in the morning, they're offering a burnt offering for all the sins of Israel. In the evening, they're offering a burnt offering for all the sins of Israel, right? And the next day, they're going to do the same thing over and over and over again. Daily, they are making all of these sacrifices. He doesn't have to do this every day. Right? Jesus doesn't have to do it every day. He doesn't have to do it every week. He doesn't have to do it every month. He doesn't have to do it every year. How many times did Jesus have to do it? Once, right? And, and the Greek word that's there indicates that it's once for all time. It's not just once for, for this generation. It's not just once for this group. It's once for all time. Because that blood of Jesus is what gives us our forgiveness of our sins. What gave them forgiveness of their sins in the Mosaic time? Well, they rolled them four, right? But they, they offered a lot of animals, right, to, to get the atonement. But what ultimately, was, what ultimately is going to take their sins away in the Old Testament times? The blood of Christ, right? Right. But see, in God's mind, Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, right? So in God's mind, he exists outside of time, right? And so in God's mind, Jesus has always been sacrifice for the sins of the people. So what is it that forgave the sin? What was it that provided forgiveness of sins for the people under the first covenant? It was the blood of Christ, right? It was once for all time, right? Not just our time, not just going forward, but even going backwards. That the blood flows both directions from the cross. 
And so he doesn't have to offer up sacrifices for his own sins. He, he offered up himself, right? And so we're going to have, when we get into chapters 9 and 10 especially, a discussion about the new covenant and the fact that we've got a better sacrifice, right? That Jesus is a better sacrifice because the Hebrews writer will say in chapter 10 and verse 4 that it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We needed that better sacrifice of Jesus, right? We needed his blood shed. And so he doesn't need to offer up these sacrifices daily. He did it once, right? Did it once for all time uh, when he offered up himself. It says, for the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, right? Those men that were high priests, they have weakness. They, they, they sin, they fall short, they, they don't uh, do perfect all the time. So the, the law, right, appoints priests who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, and he makes a point of, of stressing this again, the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. The oath came after the law. The law said you had to be from the tribe of Levi to be a priest. The law said that you had to be from the family of Aaron to be a high priest. The oath, you are a priest forever according to Melchizedek, right? The Lord has sworn and will not. That oath that David penned in Psalm 110 came after the institution of the law. Law went into effect somewhere around 1440 B.C. when Moses received it from God on Mount Sinai. But David lived in 1000 B.C. He lived some 440 years later. And he says, there's another priest that's coming. There's a different kind of priest that's coming, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so the oath came after the law, which means that there's got to be a change in the law. If you're going to have a different kind of priest, right, the priesthood's going to be changed. The law's going to have to be changed. Covenant is going to have to be changed. And so he's drawing out all the implications of Psalm 110.4 being true. That if there's going to be another priesthood, there's going to have to be a change in the law, and there's going to have to be a different covenant. Does this make sense? Comments or questions on these things? Well, yeah, he did it for us. He went to the cross. He suffered all of that. And you don't read anything about you know, him crying out in agony and pain through all the physical things, but the, the emotional, right? Uh, the emotional stress. Uh, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, that that was a bigger deal maybe than the, all the physical stuff that he had to go through. Well, and then you're without your parents and all this, and you think, you know, this is really a major step. Well, to think about Christ here, to be without God. And, and God's it. I mean, He controls everything. And all of a sudden, you're all alone. Yeah, but He wasn't really alone. I mean, He, um, you know, the. the, the know, but, you yeah. Know, Well, that's the challenge for the Hebrew Christians, right? The challenge for these Jewish Christians is that Judaism would be what they've always known, right? It would be comfortable to them. It would be what they had been doing their whole life. And now Jesus has come and he's kind of turned the tables on that and said it's not just this physical thing that you do, but you've got to have the right things in your heart, right? He takes it a level deeper in, with Christianity than what they had in the Mosaic system. But he's trying to show them that everything that they have in Christianity is better, right? That the natural outflow of Judaism is Christianity. It's the, the natural progression. That the law was there to show people that they couldn't do things perfectly, that they needed that Savior, that we needed Jesus, that we needed the Christ, that we needed the Messiah to be able to take our sins upon himself uh, on the cross and be able to do that for us. Um, and so everything 
in the Mosaic system is leading up to the Messiah, right? It's leading up to the Messiah coming, all the foreshadowing that is there. Uh, and the, the Hebrews writer is going to talk about the, the copies and shadows uh, here in a little bit. But you have all this foreshadowing that takes place leading up to Christianity coming, that Jesus is coming, that the Messiah is coming. And so he's been perfected forever, right? He's been perfected. He was perfected by the things which he suffered. He was perfected because even though he was a son, yet he had to learn obedience, right, by the things that he suffered. He's been perfected or made complete in, in being our, our sacrifice. And so when we get into chapter 8, he's, the Hebrews writer says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. This is the main thing, right? After seven chapters of the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews writer says, this is the main thing that we've been talking about, right? What have we looked at so far? Well, we've looked at two things. We've looked at Jesus being the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father. We've looked at Jesus being our high priest. And so he's sort of summing up here, right, in this, these last uh, six verses of this section here, the first six verses of chapter 8. This is the main point of what we've been saying. We have such a high priest. We have such a great high priest, Right, who is seated at the right hand of the throne. What has he done? He's weaving those two passages together. He's weaving those two ideas together that he's been talking about, that Jesus is the one who's ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, and he's the one who's our high priest. He's a priest on his throne, and he's currently reigning. That's important because our lesson tonight is going to be about what's wrong with premillennialism. There are folks that think that Jesus isn't reigning yet, that he hasn't established the kingdom yet. But the Hebrews writer here is saying, no, he's ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is reigning now <clears throat> as both king and priest. Not something that's to come way off in the future, but something that's already, already taken place. <clears throat> and so he says, he's a minister uh, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected. He's a minister. That word that's used there for minister means that he, is a, he ministers as a priest. Right, it's a word that's meant for priestly ministry. And it's a word that the, the Hebrews writer has used before. If you come back to Hebrews chapter 1, where he's talking about Jesus being superior to the angels, he talks about the angels and who are the angels. In verse 7 of chapter 1, he, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He talks about the angels being ministers, that they minister as priests. And we looked at some passages when we were in chapter 1 in, in the book of Revelation that shows the angels there offering up uh, the incense to God, right? The angels there uh, before the throne of God, that they are ministering as priests in heaven. In verse 14, it says, again, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation, right? They're ministering spirits. They minister as priests. That same word is used there. And so while the priests are ministering as, while the angels are ministering as priests in heaven, Jesus is ministering as our high priest, right? That's, he's a minister, right? Ministering as priest uh, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So he mentions here both the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. When Moses was instructed to build what he built, right, he was to build a tabernacle for the Lord, right? And God gave him the pattern that he is supposed to follow, that, that he showed him on the mountain. Here's the way that you make all things. They were to make for God a sanctuary, which is literally a holy place, and a tabernacle, or a dwelling place, or a most holy place. And when you look at the construction of the tabernacle itself, it had that holy place, right? Now, what makes it holy? 
because God has designated it, right? God has said that it's, it's, a, it's not a place that anybody is going to go into. It's a place that's set apart, that only the priests are going to go into this holy place. And inside that holy place, you remember they had the table of showbread uh, on, I guess it would be the northern wall of the tent. They had the menorah would be on the southern wall of the tent. They had the altar of incense that would be there right before the veil, right? And then the veil would close off what was behind it was the most holy place. You remember what was in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. And who was allowed to go back there? Just the high priest, right? And only one day a year that he was allowed to go back there. And so you've got all of this that, that God is showing this pattern to Moses, right? And saying that, you know, I want you to build me a sanctuary and a, and a tabernacle. Come over, you'll see that it's in Exodus chapter 25. We'll take a look at that. Our study of the book of Exodus, I think, was a good lead-in for what we're looking at in Hebrews because there's so much in Hebrews that harkens back to the old law. But notice in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, it says, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, just so you shall make it. He talks about a sanctuary and he talks about a place where he's going to dwell. Right? A holy place and a most holy place. Two different words there in the Hebrew to indicate those two places. Um, in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40, that's where you get the, the quote uh, where God tells Moses, see that you make all these things. Right? See that you make all them according to the pattern which was shown on you to you on the mountain. The pattern, the, the type. Right? So you've got a type and an anti-type. This tabernacle that was on earth, the temple that was on earth is a type. The anti-type, the true one, the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary is in heaven. And all the things that Moses made on earth were patterned after what is in heaven. That mercy seat was a representation of God's throne. That's where they spoke to God. That's where they came and met God, right? The, he would speak to them from between the two cherubim. Uh, God told Moses that was where he was going to speak to the high priest. That's where they were going to meet with him. And so <clears throat> it says that Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So he's not talking about Jesus being in that physical earthly tabernacle that Moses constructed. He's not talking about Jesus being in that, that dwelling place in the temple right, where this temple that Solomon built or the temple later on that was built by, by Herod, <clears throat> not talking about the ones that were constructed by man with human hands, <clears throat> but he's talking about him being in a sanctuary and a holy place, a, a dwelling place that was made by God, right, talking about that heavenly tabernacle, talking about a different place where Jesus took his blood, right, and offered it up for the Father. Do you see this? Is this making sense, or have I lost anybody? Sometimes I get deep into this, and I don't think about how complicated some of it can be. <clears throat> but we don't think about this uh, very often, right? We don't, see, we don't see other texts that really deal with this uh, very much. This is the one place where we, where we see this. But the true tabernacle is the one that's in heaven. The copy is on earth, right? And, and which is, what's going to be better? Is the original going to be better than the copy? Yeah, original is going to be better than the copy, right? The copy is never going to be better than the original. If you make a copy of something, right, it, it gets maybe a little blurry, uh, and it, it actually grows. If you copy something at 100%, it comes out a little bit bigger than 100%. And so if you make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, it, it gets degraded, right? It gets harder to read. It gets more blurry. Uh, and the original is always better, right? And so he refers to the, what is here on earth as the copy and the shadow. Notice in verse 5. Those priests who are on earth, right, who are offering gifts according to the Mosaic law, right, those priests, it says, serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. They're a copy. What's on in the ta temple is a copy of what's in heaven. It's a shadow, right? And can a shadow do any, any damage to you? Can a shadow hurt you? 
If you, if you go outside and you go and you get where the sun is behind you and, and you do some shadow boxing, is your shadow going to reach out and, and hit you in the jaw? Shadow is, right, it's the real thing that, that casts the shadow, right? The original, the, the real thing. And so that's what he's talking about, that there is something so much better that's in heaven, right, that is the true tabernacle that God erected where Jesus went. He didn't go into the earthly temple uh, with his blood after his blood was shed. But he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man in verse 2. Every high priest, it says, is, is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. When they appointed the priests, the priests had a job to offer gifts and sacrifices. In the old Mosaic system, you had different, uh, you had different blood sacrifices. You had some of them that would be for sins. You might bring a, a whole burnt offering, and that animal, the whole thing would be burned up, it would be offered to God. There wouldn't be uh, anything else done with that animal other than it would be offered to God completely. They would offer that for, for sins. They might have something where they sinned against somebody else. It was a sin offering that they had to make. They had to offer an animal. And the, the fatty portions, there were parts of that that would be burned up that would be God's part. And then there was a part of that that the priest could eat. But the person who was offering the animal because of their sin, they didn't get to eat any of that. They weren't going to get to benefit from their sin at all, right? So they weren't able to partake of any of those things. And so you've got those sacrifices that were made for sins and trespasses, but they also offered gifts. They, some of the sacrifices that they brought or some of the animals that they brought were thank offerings to God. They're, they're basically expressing a thankfulness for something that God has done for them or just expressing thankfulness, a free will offering that they would bring, that they're just expressing their gratitude to God in general. Well, they could sit down and they could partake of that animal. It's kind of like having a fellowship meal. That they could sit down and they could enjoy some of that. They were to eat that in a holy place. They were to eat that in the, the temple complex itself, not in the holy place where the table and the menorah were, but they were to eat that in a clean place, right? That they would come together and be able to do that. And so it talks about these priests on earth, that they're offering both gifts and sacrifices, right? So they're, they're ministering over both of those things uh, on earth. And so because that's what the priest does, the priest offers gifts and sacrifices, the, the priest connects people to God, well, Jesus, as our high priest, had to do the same thing. If he's going to connect the people to God, he's got to bring a gift. He's got to bring a sacrifice, which was the sacrifice of himself, right, that he brought in order to reconcile man to God, in order to bring man and God back together. And it was the only thing that could do it. It was the only thing that could bring man and God back together. And so it was necessary that he have something to offer. Now, he says in verse 4, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, Right? If Jesus was, tr was wanting to be a priest on earth, what tribe is he from? Judah. Judah, right? If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, right? Because he's not from the tribe of Levi. It's not, if you're going to offer gifts and sacrifices according to the law, according to the Mosaic law, and you are Jewish, You've got to be from the tribe of Levi. You've got to be, to be a high priest, you've got to be from the family of Aaron. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, right? So emphasizing the fact that Jesus is doing this in heaven, that he's our high priest in heaven and not our high priest on earth. He's not coming back down here, right, to be our high priest someday. He's, he's already doing that where he's reigning from heaven. The priests that are on earth, we said, serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. Moses was told to make everything according to the pattern that was shown on the mountain. But now, it says in verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Right? Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. Um, it's better. And it's the, the idea of the ministry is that it's a priestly ministry. Right? Same root word that we saw before with him uh, being a minister, with the angels being a minister, that they minister as priests, right? He has a more excellent priestly ministry than what they had under the old system, than what they had under Judaism. It's, you might say it's more better, right? I don't know if that's... Garth Brooks, back in the day when he was popular, I guess it goes all the way back to the 1990s. Some of you are too young to remember but you can you could Google Garth Brooks, but he had a he had his own clothing line, right? And he had his own shirts. They had these uh, like checkerboard white and black uh, shirts. And the, the brand name, do you remember what the brand name was? It was Mo Better, <laughs> right? It was Mo Better. And so Jesus's ministry, right, is Mo Better than what they had under the 
Judaic system, right? It's, it's better than what they had under Judaism. It's better than what they had with the Levites and with the, the family of Aaron being the high priest because he's been appointed priest by God through an oath. And it's never going to change. He's never going to die. He's never going to have to offer another sacrifice. All of that is better. And he's the only priest who is both the priest and the sacrifice. He's the, yeah, he's the priest. He's the sacrifice. He's the king. Right? He's all of those things. <laughs> he's the son. Right? All of those things. And this would really drive the point. I mean, that's what the Hebrews writer is trying to do. He's really wanting to drive the point home to these Hebrew Christians, so that they get you. You need to understand just how much better, right? Look at what a great high priest we have who has passed through the heavens, right? That he's seated at the right hand of the Father, that he's the one who's reigning, he's the one who's ruling. He's really wanting to drive that point home, you know, that he is, he is a, a mediator, right, of a better covenant established on better promises. He's obtained a more excellent ministry that he's the son who's been perfected uh, forever, that he's that, that better sacrifice for us. And so if you've got all these things that are better, right, if everything in Christianity is better, if everything with Jesus is better, well, then why would you want to go back, right? Why would you want to go back to something uh, that's inferior? Why would you want to go back to something that's, that's got shortcomings, right? We have a better covenant, he says, established on better promises, Back in chapter 7, he talked about how we have a better hope, right? We've got a better covenant, he says in, in chapter 7 and verse 22. The covenant that we have, the agreement that we have with God, as we'll see, um, probably next week because we have five minutes and I'm not going to be able to get through the whole covenant thing in five minutes. But we've got a better covenant that was established on better promises, right? We've got a better hope that's established on better promises. What was the promises then? Right? Moses said, look, here's what it is that God has said he wants you to do. If you will do this, he's going he's to put you in this land of Canaan. You're going to have a land that flows with milk and honey. It was a, a physical reward. Right? They were going to have peace from their enemies. And so the promises then were if you do what it is that God wants, God is going to bless you. Right? But the blessing was in a physical way. And if you don't do what God wants you to do, you're going to lose the blessings, but you were also going to inherit some curses. There were going to be there were going to be some additional punishment. So not only do you just lose the blessings that you have, but you, you're going to incur like progressive punishment. It's going to get worse because if you continue to ignore God, if you continue to walk against God, well, that punishment's going to get worse, and then it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. It was physical, but it says now we've got a better promise. Well, what's He promised us? If we if we do what it is that He says, what has He promised us? A home in heaven, right? And how long does that last? Forever. For eternity, right? It lasts forever. It's not like we're going to go to heaven and we're going to be there for a little while and then we're going to fall short again like the Israelites did and the enemies are going to come in and make them, right, servants of them like the Philistines did or like the, uh, the, other, the Amorites that were around them, right, the Canaanites, that they, the land that they lived in. They were oppressed by all those different people in the book of Judges, right, over and over and over again. When we get to heaven, that's a better promise, isn't it? Because we're not going to have to worry about being surrounded by enemies. We're not going to have to worry about dwelling with enemies. We're not going to have to worry about people oppressing us and making us into servants. We're not going to have to worry about idolatry, right? He's able to save to the uttermost, he's able to save forever those who come to God through him, right? A better promise. That's a better promise, isn't it? That's a better hope, isn't it? Comments or questions on these things? Well, it is, it is a big change, yeah. Right. It's, it, 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 it's a major difference. It, it, it is. Because we're under grace. Right. Well, yeah, we, we, we understand it because it's a system that we've lived under, but, but maybe, maybe it's not the system that we've lived under. 
Um, the first 32 years of my life, I was raised as a, as a Roman Catholic. And um, when you find something that's true to God's word, when you find that what you believe and what you practice isn't what it is that God would have you to do, then you've got to be willing to make a change. Saul thought that he was doing what it is that God wanted him to do, right? He was persecuting the church. He was rounding up Christians. He was putting them in jail. He was having them killed. He thought he was doing what God wanted him to do, but he found out that he was wrong. And when he found out that he was wrong, he was willing to change, right? When we find out that we're wrong, we've got to, and even if we've been raised in the church and we think something, we, we think that something's okay or we think that some activity is all right or we think that something that we're doing is, and we read in the scripture and we find that that's not the case, what do we have to be willing to do? Got to be willing to change, right? Yeah, they, they may have been stubborn. They, they may have dug their heels, and a lot of them were stubborn and dug their heels in and didn't want to change. They didn't want to, because that's what they've known their whole life. And you'll run into people that'll say, well, this was good enough for, for my grandparents, and this was good enough for my mom and dad, and so it's good enough for me. But what is it that God wants? What is it that God wants? He wants what's good enough for him. He wants, Amen. yeah. What he wants is, is really for the best for us, right? He wants, he wants the best for us, that home in heaven for eternity. And, but we've got to do what, what he wants us to do. We've got to be the kind of people he wants us to be. We have to try our best. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're not going to fall short. But we've got to be aiming for that, right? We've got to be aiming for that or we won't come anywhere near it. Any last-minute comments, questions, or snide remarks? We'll break for worship. All right, thank you for your attention.